Open the pod bay doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wild away. 6, 56 degrees. So I was hired at Montana State as a British historian and a historian of science. But what I really did was history of the oceans. Actually, what I did was history of 19th century tidal theory, which sounds about as boring as it actually is, <laughs> which is why my book is ranked 3 million on Amazon uh, as we speak. But it is unique. A lot of people don't do history of the oceans. Uh, in fact, history is largely landlocked. It's about politics, it's about um, uh, wars and battles and these sorts of things. So we haven't looked at the history of the ocean a lot. I'll read just very quickly a, a, a small quote from Henry David Thoreau that has set the stage, I think, for how we think about the oceans. He says, we do not associate the idea of antiquity with the ocean, nor wonder how it looked a thousand years ago as we do of the land, for it was equally wild and unfathomable always. I think what he's saying is, you know, when we go to the ocean, we don't leave traces, and we can't see beneath it. So the history of it uh, gets lost. But although we don't write about it, our, our certainly engagement with it uh, runs very deep. The oceans uh, cover three quarters of, of the globe. 40% uh, of the world's population lives next to them. 80% lives uh, within about 60 miles. Everyone in Britain, uh, which is what I study, everyone lives within 60 miles uh, of the ocean. It's where life first began. It's where civilization first took root. There's a reason why when we look for uh, extraterrestrial life, we always look for water. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good sign uh, that it's there. The Pacific in general, uh, which is where uh, this takes place, it's by far the biggest ocean. Uh, it's about as big uh, as the other oceans uh, combined. Uh, the ocean itself is dramatic geologically, if you could look under it. It's got the largest mountain range in the world, 40,000 mile mountain range. Many of you kids out there probably think Everest is the biggest mountain uh, at 29,000 feet, but that's chump change uh, to Mount Kia in uh, Hawaii, which is 34,000 and change, almost a mile, a mile, mile higher. The Mariana Trench uh, is, the, is the lowest place on the earth. It descends 35,000 feet. And while about a dozen people have stood on the moon and about a hundred people have been into space, only two people have ever gone to the Mariana Trench and, and come back. And again, while we don't visit it a lot, uh, our relation to it uh, runs very deep. And different cultures in different times have had different relationships with the ocean, and I think this film uh, highlights that. Micronesian cultures uh, before European contact uh, often uh, viewed the ocean as part of their state, as part of their territory. Uh, it pro provided resources, it linked people. At the same time, cultures in the Indian Ocean or near the Indian Ocean viewed the seas surrounding their uh, islands as a space apart. And that was largely due to the problems of trade uh, and connections uh, that relied on, um, on uh, the, 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 the difficultness of traveling in the ocean. In Western tradition at that time, the oceans were very much a, a, a space of the other, something to be, uh, to stay away from. Uh, that prevailed until about the 17th century when it became a place of control. So uh, again, just a very quick uh, quote from Sir Walter Raleigh, who uh, spoke to the queen early 17th century. He says, he who commands the sea commands the trade routes of the world. 
He who commands the trade routes commands the trade. He who commands the trade commands the riches of the world and thus the world itself. It's very interesting because that's how Western cultures have viewed the ocean as a place, a, a highway, as a place of trade, but also something that you could never own. So freedom of the seas and the lack of ownership has dictated how we have viewed the oceans in the past. But it also means that uh, we're not necessarily responsible for it or, again, an ahistorical view of not having a relationship with it. It is a place that we experience geological time on the coast for the first time. As you can see, you know, mountains erode and are grown. The moon slows the earth. There are these geological processes that are so long geologically we can't see them. But near the ocean, you can see the change in the level of the land and sea. You can see the erosion processes. And so the founding fathers of geology, like Charles Lyell, relied heavily on uh, the ocean and the, the oceanic tides uh, for, for their geological explanations. It's also a place where we worked and lived, and so the close alliteration, alliteration means for you kids, kind of the similar sounding of the words between time and tide, show you how much of our daily rhythms were related uh, to the oceans. I think that's what I love about this film. So we won't try to save what we don't understand. We won't try to, um, to keep healthy what is separate from us. But our relationship with the oceans date, dates uh, since we, and in different cultures in different ways, since we've been experiencing it. Um, we need to have a sort of sea ethic uh, as long, uh, alongside the land ethic. Uh, and that's what I love about this film. I think it, it enters us into a new era of thinking about the ocean. It, it is a uniting body. It unites families, it unites communities, and it even unites different cultures. And I think you see that uh, in the film. We've all had, all cultures have had a relationship and, uh, with the ocean, uh, and that comes out, uh, I think, in this film uh, very well. Someone who knows a lot about that is uh, my PhD student, actually, uh, Gianna uh, Savoy, who um, is writing a lot. Uh, she promises me chapters. I haven't seen them yet, uh, but I'm sure she's telling the truth. Um, uh, but her work has been instrumental, I think, in describing what I just described. This idea that we need to understand our relationship to the oceans, we need to understand their history, uh, and it's by doing that uh, and really comprehending uh, our close association with it uh, that we can, we can help save uh, one of the, the truly resources, the engines, uh, for what guides uh, us on the planet. So I'll give you to Jan. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so did any of you see that coming? <laughs> no pressure on me, huh? <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you. Um, and thanks to the Bozeman Film Society for having us here. This is pretty awesome. It's also uh, World Oceans Month this month, so it's a great time to be showing this film. Um, just a little more about my experience. So I'm, um, as Lisa said, I'm a, a film professor. I'm also a filmmaker. Um, and I am also the executive director of a nonprofit organization called the Ocean Media Institute. And we're trying to do all the things Michael was actually talking about, um, to bring together scientists and and um, the public and different institutions and um, different cultures together to tell these stories about the ocean in visual, uh, meaningful visual ways. So um, I'm coming to you today, I am not a scholar of, of Maori culture, but I actually did spend quite a bit of time with, um, with the Maori and with people of the Pacific working on a film, which one of these, um, which this picture is actually taken from this film I worked on, 
called Our Blue Canoe, which was um, a feature documentary that told the story of about 150 South Pacific Islanders that sailed across the Pacific in these vacas, these voyaging canoes called vacas, or I think in the movie, in the, the Maoris call them wakas. Um, and they did it to reconnect with their voyaging heritage. So they do, um, you know, traditional voyaging is, uses a lot of celestial navigation. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, and also reconnecting with uh, the ocean itself and spreading the message of stewardship. And um, so you can go to the next slide for that. So one thing I learned from being with these people, when, you know, when you're a producer and um, interviewing people, the, the most important thing to do is listen. Listen to pe what people are telling you. And the constant refrain that I kept hearing from these people was this, we are of this ocean. And you know, their connection to the ocean is so deeply embedded um, in everything they are and they do, from their work to their spirituality to the way they interact with each other um, to their stewardship. Um, and that goes for the, the ocean and for the creatures that live in the ocean. You can go to the next slide. And one of those creatures is actually one that is uh, sort of featured in this film we'll be talking about. Paikea is the Maori word for whale. Um, it is, also happens to be the name of our hero in the film tonight, so you'll, and that's no coincidence. Um, and Paikea is very important to the Maori um, because they were the, the guardians of the Maori's ancestors. They believed that they were the ones that led the way across the Pacific from Hawaii, their, their ancestral lands, to, to uh, Aotearoa, which is the Maori word for New Zealand. So you could go to the next slide. <laughs> and so these are some of my Maori friends. <laughs> um, and they decided to, they, they, they actually dubbed the name of the voyage that we were on, Te Mana o Te Moana, which means the spirit of the ocean. And again, that goes back to um, that connection and that um, their, their goal for bringing that, that, that story of the ocean, the, their connection to it, to the people that they visited along the way. So this voyage, by the way, they started, they, I think at the end they went over 40,000 miles. <laughs> they, they started in New Zealand, they went up to Tahiti and the Marquesas, they went up to Hawaii, across to San Francisco, down the whole west coast to Mexico and Costa Rica, out to the Galapagos, um, the Solomon Islands, and then back to their, their home island. So it took them about a year and a half of travel. Um, and I, I spent a lot of that time with them and sailing with them and uh, getting to know them. So, um, so think about the first thing that comes to your head when you see this picture. Um, is it the word scientist? I hope so. <laughs> okay, maybe not, but it should be. And here's why, go to the next. <laughs> because celest when you're, celestial navigation relies on so many types of science, sciences. Um, you know, from astronomy, when you're, they are you know, mapping their way across the ocean, using the stars as their guide, they have to know where every single um, you know, celestial body, basically, <laughs> where, where um, stars are rising and setting on the horizon uh, in relation to, the, to their boat that they're on. Um, they need to know oceanography, they need to understand ocean currents and uh, the way the, the ocean moves and, um, and also meteorology, they need to pay attention to be able to read uh, the wind and cloud formations and wind patterns and kind of get all that. Uh, ecology, they're tuned into, like I said, the whales of course, um, but other animals that they're seeing, so certain birds might only uh, if they're nesting on land and feeding in, in the ocean, um, they may only go, say, 50 miles out to sea. If they see one of those, they know they're, okay, well, they're within 50 miles of land. So they're constantly learning this. Um, and then, of course, technology. They need to build these boats <laughs> to get them across tens of thousands of miles of ocean. And that's pretty incredible. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and, so, and that's what they're doing. They're using the lessons of the past to propel us all forward. So I'm looking at this as a very, you know, it, it's something that's very contemporary. They're not, these are not people that are living in the past. We're not romanticizing like the old days of their ancestry. It's actually, they're actually using this, this, this knowledge to, to, in very contemporary real ways. So I don't know if you can notice anything about that, 
photo that is a little different than maybe what you've seen pictures of, of, of traditional facas. Um, but if you haven't noticed, there's a solar panel down on the, on the bottom end of it. And so yeah, they've built these boats with actually using solar panels too. So there's this marriage of the ancient and modern that they're actually um, you know, using today to, to, to build more of these. You can go to the next slide. And um, I like to say it's, you know, there's a Faka Renaissance happening right now. It's where ancient wisdom meets green tech. <laughs> um, and they're using, they're now making these, these, these Fakas in three different sizes. They've got the big voyaging canoes, which are for very massive voyages. Um, they're also making smaller ones that they use for inter-island transport. Um, or um, some ocean classroom kind of stuff, doing science and cultural education. Um, they have smaller vacas, also with solar panels, and um, I think they're using coconut oil engines now um, for sustainable fishing and development. They would have to spend, in the old days, for th with their, <laughs> in the old days, the new days, old days, they would have to spend um, about half of the money that they took in from their, from their catch fishing um, and spend that on diesel fuel. So, Having not to do that is, is a good thing. Disaster relief, they're actually using them for, um, to uh, bring aid and, and materials and, and supplies to other islands when, when hurricanes strike. They just uh, did that for Hurricane Pam when that was, I think, last year. Um, and ecotourism, they're doing whale watches and, and cruises and sightseeing and using the vacas for that and also teaching kind of the ways of their, their culture. Next slide. And so I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit. So what we're doing with Ocean Media Institute, which sort of started as a side project to my PhD and then kind of uh, grew on a life of its own. Um, but we're trying to, to pull all this together. So uh, we're trying to, to um, you know, tell the story of the ocean, create that connection for people, um, so that they can, so that the public can can understand these ocean issues in ways that, you know, they're not being beat over the head with with some of the the messaging, but actually get it in, in something that actually hits them in the heart and they can connect to. Um, one of the the things that we're doing, one of our programs is called I Am Ocean, and um, that's the, we're doing we're doing these little we call them video postcards of people um, telling their own story about their connection to their particular ocean region. And we're hoping that when other people see those, they can learn about a different ocean region through these people telling their stories. And so it could be some, it could be a coral scientist, it could be a fisherman, it could be um, you know, a surfer or a sailor. And one I'm gonna show you actually is this woman here, Pua Case. She's a native Hawaiian cultural leader. I actually met her when I was working on the Voyager film. Um, and she is, uh, uh, She's a spiritual leader, she's a cultural leader, and her connection to the ocean is actually through the summit of Mauna Kea. So she connects to the ocean through her, her culture and her love for this mountain. So I'll just show you that, it's only a couple of minutes long. Once upon a time, a people traveled here, the first people. And the first thing they saw as they arrived was that mountain, our mountain, Mauna Awakea. The mountain that is a beacon to bring us home and the mountain that is the beacon to send us off. mountain is where the prayers are sent above the mountain to the realm of Wake. And for us, the mountain is where the ocean really begins.
I have to say the ocean has shaped my life. I was raised at the ocean. I was raised with my grandmother, a grandmother who knew that the ocean would feed us, sustain us, give us life, give us understanding, connect us in a way that nobody else would understand unless they were swimming in it, taking food from it, praying for it. And so the ocean shaped me from that moment. And the chance that I know and the understanding that I have with the elements and the deities and the spirit world has shaped my life. And that is from the ocean, from the mountain, and from everywhere in between. So our tagline is crafting deeper stories and so what we're trying to do and what I'm hoping to do is to get people to you know connect to this ocean through these stories that um, somehow touches them in ways that they didn't expect right um, and the only way we're ever going to come together on ocean issues which we really do need to do because there, there, there are some critical things happening is um, by kind of listening to each other and sharing each other's stories and finding ways to make those connections to each other um, you know that we may may not have expected to happen um, and I think when we do that you know we can bring meaning to the science and start to understand things on a deeper a deeper level um, last slide and so that's um, if you would like to get in touch with us you can find us through oceanmediainstitute.org we will actually be in the lobby after um, you can sign up for our newsletter we have some t-shirts um, come talk to us I'll be there Emmy Lindemann who's our, our um, outreach coordinators with us tonight too and um, we're really excited to, to be co-producing this event and bringing this story to you guys hope it touches you as much as it, it did us so thanks And now say kia ora, which means, it means, well, it means hello, and it also means <laughs> thanks in, in Maori. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Everybody. Kia ora. Kia ora. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Gianna and Michael. Enjoy the film, and we'll see you again uh, at the Ellen Theater.